I'm Cynthia. I work with the Misty Rivers Community Arts Council. We are hosting this online painting demonstration with Leah, and we are thrilled to have her here. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we are on unceded Gitsan territory. Um, specifically at the Arts Centre here, we are on the territory of Chief Nicodane and the House of Nicodane. So uh, we weren't able to have Chief Nicodane come to do a welcome today, but we are so honoured to have an ongoing relationship with her and the House of Nicodane. Uh, we had an art show by one of the House members here last year, and we look forward to building and deepening that relationship and connection as we move forward. Um, so I, I would like to introduce the lovely Leah Pipe, who is doing our Raven painting demonstration today. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Leah. And uh, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for coming today and going through kind of the emails and all the registration and stuff like that. And sorry if you're having a bit of technical issues, but uh, anyways, we're here. Thanks for joining me on a Saturday. Um, I decided to do this because um, over the years, I've had a few friends who happen to have been in my house while I've been painting and some of their comments have kind of inspired me to maybe share this with others because they'll say something like, oh, I didn't know that's how you did that or I didn't realize this or it's fun to watch. And, and um, I know some of you are interested in learning how to paint or to advance your painting, learn how to paint Radiant Raven. And I don't think I would call this kind of instructional video. It's certainly not a workshop kind of thing. Some people asked if you need supplies and I think that'll be a different type of thing I might do in the future where I'll structure it differently and make sure you have everything you need and we'll go through it. So rather than that, I it's a painting day for me and I have a little painting, a little raven that I have to paint. And I thought I'd have you in my house while I'm painting it. And of course, I'm going to talk while I'm painting and I'm going to share as much information as possible, but you'll get to see how I paint ravens yeah, for the most part. I have a couple different strategies and this is how I use um, uh, this strategy for the smaller paintings. And uh, I wanna show you what I have here. So this is my linen canvas. And let me know if I'm, I'm kind of compacted here and trying to get you guys in to see this and it might be too dark or it might be just want to make sure if anybody can't see the raven and i'm going to do some handheld so while i do some smaller details i'll i'll try and bring you in i'm kind of learning as i go too so feel free to give me some feedback or shout out or you can't see anything just let me know um this is one of my favorite canvases it's called a linen uh, a plain linen canvas i get them from opus art supplies out of vancouver and they make them with this clear gesso so if this was actual raw linen when you would add pigment and paint it would bleed and so this is instead of a white gesso it's a clear gesso so you can apply paint to it um i want to show you really quickly how this is one strategy where i shape out the uh the black shape of the subject matter and um this is my other way i want to show you so i do that for my smaller ones typically and let's see here this is how I do my big ones. So you can see very different, but the process overlaps. So there's the big guy. Pretty excited about that one. Um, yeah, so it kind of works the same way, just kind of shuffling the, the layers a little bit. So I want to show you, this is my photo that I'm working on today. And I'm a, what's called a photo based artist or a photo realist. And we use photo sources rather than strictly imagination. Um, and there's some wildlife painters that are super high, re high realism. I'm sure you've seen them out there. And I'm not sure I'm like that, but I kind of do painterly strokes and it does look like a raven at the end, but I have some of these colors that I'll push into the painting as well. So this is my Photo source. I'm going to place right here. Let's see if I can get that in the screen. Let's see here. Yeah. Okay. There's the three of us. See that? My beak. <laughs> 
I wanted to show you how I managed to get this. I have my trusted assistant and friend Lexi helps me with the base layers and to, to kind of start my paintings. But I did do this to show you kind of how it starts. So this is my pre-sketch and it's very loose. I consider this loose, but <laughs> anyways, I just do some loose outlining and then I then it's painted all the way covered in black. And that's how we end up with this guy. And yes, it's kind of sad that I kind of cover some of these lines, but by memory, I kind of know where those are. And I'm understanding that in order to, whoops, in order to um, do this kind of painting, you know, there's obviously a level of drawing that's needed, um, a level of understanding how to sketch. And I have done kind of like beginner drawing classes and hopefully in the future I can do that so that we can do the full process of how to lay in these details and then how to paint a raven. So that'll come to the future. I'm just gonna pick up the canvas I draw. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so we have our black shape. I'm gonna make sure you see that. Maybe I'll pull it a little bit closer. How's that guys? And I use, let's see. I wanted to give a little tip before we continue. I have on my easel these white strips of foam and there's two of them there and I put the canvas, now it's got the canvas separate on your painted land. It's just a brush strokes go off the canvas and not hit your ledge. And so when you do that, the paint kind of will, you know, ooze underneath and your paint canvas can actually stick to your cam your, your easel and, and also make a bit of a mess under on the underside of your canvas. So I prop it up. You can use strips of cardboard. Here I've used foam board just to give it a little bit of a space so that your brush can easily go off the canvas. Um, I want to do a little hello to August. I hear Cecilia and August are on. Yay, figured it out. Hello, Cecilia. Um, this is a young student from Florida is joining us today. I'm super excited. And I love when youth are interested in art. And um, I understand your art teachers are hard to ex uh, be accessible through the pandemic. And you're doing a lot of YouTubing and things like that. And I just fully support that and fully support you doing videos like this um, and just gather the information you can. YouTube has taught me a lot. So <laughs> anyways, hi in Florida. Um, okay, so just to catch you up. So I'll do a shape of the raven. This is the photo I'm working from. I prop it up right beside and it's painted solid black. This paint probably does about two, three coats because you have to make it nice and solid and it's all dry. And then I come in with my special white pencil. And this is a pencil that is water soluble. So any pencil lines I can wash off and dissolve and or I use chalk. And of course chalk you can't get as sharp a point. So I'll do the, the little details in the pencil and then the larger ones like this and I'll remove this white. It can be a little distracting, but um, when you start painting with all these white lines on there, but this is kind of how I paint things. And so anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and sketch just the, I call it mapping out the raven. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I wanted to say that this is weird, but when I paint anything, I disassociate what I, what is the subject matter. I actually, let me just pull my screen down here. There we go. I actually mentally disconnect from the raven. Like I no longer look at it as a raven. I know that sounds weird, but I start looking at shapes <clears throat> and highlights and lines. And that's how I decipher um, the, the spaces. I call it the landscape of a raven. Leah, there's a question. Oh, some of the notifications are coming up. Uh, uh, okay, great. The question, is that a prisma color or col, col erase white pencil? Does that make sense? It's actually, yeah, Prismacolor is not water soluble. You can use it. Um, you'll just have to paint over your white lines or your choice, leave the white lines showing, but you can't remove those white lines with Prismacolor. This is a brand called Aqua, Aquael, French Aquael, so Aqua and, and uh, Real at the end, and Realable, Aquaelable. And I can post that 
Um, it is by Stabilo is the manufacturer name. So it's a water soluble pencil. Uh, it can be used on paper, glass, plastic, metal, all sorts of things. And it doesn't dissolve as nicely as the chalk. So I do prefer the chalk. Um, anyways, the tight lines are gonna do with the pencil. So get my eyeballs on here. And I always start with the mouth line where the beak is, where it, I call it the mouth, but it's where the two parts of the beak meet. And this is how I start mapping this out. So I kind of follow this and bring my line in on the same angle, like so. And then I sketch out his, what I call his toupee. Underneath this flap of, of kind of spiky feathers is his nostrils and that's how he breathes. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and so, yeah, some of the, the markings on the edge kind of dictate to me where the lines go. And like I said, it's a mapping thing. I've had years of experience drawing, so I understand that this might not be as easy for you guys. I don't know if you can see those lines, so I might do them in chalk. I'm wondering if that's a little bit better. I can bring the camera closer. Is that okay? You guys can see that? So yeah. you can see these little white lines, baby. We can see it okay. uh, lightly. It's not super clear, but lightly, yeah. Okay, it'll make sense when I start painting. And so these black areas, as you can see, these dark black areas around the eye um, and down the back are already painted with my black background. So I kind of draw everything else outside of the black. So you can see these brow, his whole forehead is lighter. The lines in his toupee are lighter. This beak line is lighter. So I don't have to draw anything in the dark parts and I don't have to draw the dark parts. So you're really drawing the lighter highlights of the raven. Don't need any pencil in here, this is black. So this is how, when I disassociate from the image, I no longer see it as a raven. I'm starting to see what's light, what's dark. Yeah, there's a question here. Um, yeah. She says, uh, I'm not sure if you covered this, Amy says, but where do you get your photo resources? Ah, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to cover some of those things, maybe during drawing time. <laughs> um, and that way I'll do a layer and acrylic dries really quickly within minutes, but I do have a little waiting period. So maybe answers like that or questions like that, I can answer a little bit more in length. And um, so flag that one and uh, I'll get back to that one if that's okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get his forehead in here, gauging where his eye might be. That. Again, I'm just drawing, see this eye here? So I'm just drawing the rim and then the highlight of his eye. And this part of the raven, this here, see this really cool shape of feathers that covers its ear, that's its ear flap, which I thought was really cool. So there's a beautiful, huge ear hole behind this and this shape. So when you're drawing or painting, you know, this is where, like I said, I dissect the image into shapes. And I can see that there's this really cool shape here. That's a shape, it's all shapes and, and lines. So I'm gonna go like that. Put in chalk so it's a little bit better. And these spiky feathers, see these little guys. Yeah, I like to call it the landscape of a raven. And if you look at this as a topographical map, you know, then you have these spiky little trees <laughs> and then these hillsides. And these guys are these beautiful, I call them kind of wispy diamonds. And I'm just doing this quite rough. Like that. 
the shoulders in here. There we go. There we go. Now, let's see here. So if I'm using a line from this point down, I can see I'm a little bit off for my eye. So I'm gonna take that off and I'm gonna move the eye just over a little bit. There we go. Very loose and messy. Um, so now I'm going to start with what I call my base layer. And I wanna show you guys my paint and I will talk more about the paint in a bit, but these are all the colors that I use. So black, white, these are my magic colors, Payne's gray, turquoise, thalo, ultramarine violet, cobalt blue. Those five, if I have to put it down to a minimalist, that those five colors are, or one, two, three, four, six colors are the ones that I use the most. And I'll talk more about the paint in a bit. And so I start off with a little bit of black. Um, I'm gonna bring you over to my palette so you can see what I'm doing. You can get the mixture right. I'm all set up here with my brushes and water, spray bottle to keep my paint moist and a brand new palette. What do you think, Lex? And so your mixture for the base layer is one part black, carbon black, and three parts Payne's gray. And I'm gonna show what these colors actually look like when we're waiting for paint to dry. It's kind of cool. So roughly three times the amount of Payne's gray for the black. And I'm gonna add a little bit of white over here. If I can get it open. Stand by. Oh. And a little bit of white. So when you're mixing acrylics, black, black and white are so powerful. And one little drop of it can just blow out your blue or you know, whatever extra color you have. Likewise, the black could just kill the color. So I always try and just make small amounts of the white and black. And I'm gonna show you how I mix it up. Um, get my favorite brush here. So I don't go like this and mix them all together. I kind of slowly join them. And that way I can control um, if I've gotten too dark, a little bit of white. So I'm not gonna drag the whole thing over. I'm just gonna add a little bit of white like this. And you slowly get it all together. There we go. So what I'm mixing is a blue black, I guess, blue gray and what I want is really dark, 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 dark color. There we go. So we're getting them all mixed together. So Alexa has left a comment here. She says, haha, a brand new palette, heckin' exciting. <laughs> My friend's teasing me because I've used the same plates for I can't even remember how long and they're about they're really, really heavy now. They have like an inch thick of paint on them. So anyways, let me see. This looks pretty dark, doesn't it? And it has a blue tone to it. But on the black canvas, I'm just going to do a little tester here. With the lighting in here, it makes it look quite light. But in reality here, there's very little contrast. I know it doesn't show with the screen, but if I come back this way, you can see that the dark, it's quite dark in reality and it's enough for me to see the lines. Um, and, but dark enough, the reason I do this dark layer is I'm gonna start putting a lot of these details in with my brush. And if you make a mistake, because it's nice and dark, you have a lot of forgiveness and there's gonna be layers on top of these guys. So this is my fun layer. Um, and I think I'll just handhold this if I can. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So I'm gonna come in to the beak. And 
And now I'm just, I'm, I'm avoiding any areas that are black. I'm gonna fill in the beak. You can see the beak is quite light up here. So I have the freedom to kind of pull that through. Jocelyn has a question. She's wondering what type of brush you're using. And go around the toupee. Leah, Jocelyn has a question. Okay, we'll cover brushes. Oh, okay, sounds okay. good. Cover brushes later. Yeah, I'll just, this is, I'm gonna cover this whole guy with the first layer and it'll be wet for a little bit so we can do a little chatting then. Otherwise you'll just be watching paint dry, <laughs> which might be fun. Um, let me see if I can get you back up on here because that's a little awkward for me to paint while I'm holding the camera. Let's see if I can bring this in closer. <laughs> How's that looking? All right. Let me know if you guys can see, okay. So like I said, this layer, I'm pretty free to kind of just make mistakes. It's very forgiving. It's drying much darker than when you first put it on. Um, and get my lines in here. See all these lines kind of are on in this interesting diagonal. Now we're going into the forehead. It's one of my favorite brushes. I'm going to talk about this brush. It's a miracle brush. There we go. We're going around the eye. Hope you guys can see this okay. starting to take shape. Oh, I got the beak here. I'm gonna reserve these really teeny lines with a smaller brush later with a lighter paint. And this is just like I said, this is just mapping things out. So these are spiky little feathers. This brush does these feathers perfectly. And I'll demonstrate the strokes of this on a separate canvas so that you can actually see it a lot better. And then this guy, see this part, it's one of my favorite parts. It's almost like little tiny dots in this particular cheek plate. And then it, it extends out into longer lines. And so this is actually this perfect shape for this rounded brush, which I'll show in, in more length, but um, more detail. But I just do a dotted pattern like this to indicate those dots. And then I start pulling them out. short strokes because these are short little feathers and then they extend out this beautiful cheek plate. I call it a cheek plate but it's actually it's earmuff like so and then this these feathers here are just poker straight like that and that helps with water going off the raven's head and neck it's totally water this is a raincoat the way those these feathers are there's poker straight and fine just let the weather kind of roll off its back. I know these are pretty rough. I'm going to get more refined later. You guys have seen my final paint, uh, final raven. So, you know, there's this weird process to get there. And I always say paintings look really bad <laughs> halfway through. They, people are like, ah, but you do these really fine, fun touches at the end. There we go, again. Now this is part of the raven in this particular picture, I think is just so dynamic. So I really wanna spend some time articulating these. And I think with every portrait of a person or an animal, you know, you, I kind of decide or discover what is, you know, really popping this image off. What's 
special about this image. And for me, the eyes always have the life inside. That's how you get a, a, this kind of emotional content to your raven. And then for this particular pose, these amazing breast feathers and how they lie. It's, this is going to be my main focus is this guy. And uh, so I can be looser in the shoulder. I can be looser up here. People won't notice because as long as you can capture the drama of the raven, then you're going to have this really cool effect. Um, so I'm going to come in here and how, I'm going to show this with lighter paint. It'll show better, but I'm coming in and I'm doing these kind of shapes that are like that, I guess you can say, like elongated teardrops and around a little bit rounded at the top, pointy at the end, just like these feathers. And I make sure that I leave some black lines in there. Otherwise you won't see the separation of the feathers. They'll just kind of merge together. Now, I always try and follow the photo, <laughs> but when it gets into this kind of, it's like, I would be here for weeks and months if I was, and there are amazing artists that will do that. They will follow every single line. And I wish I could, um, but I tend to kind of start making my own pattern followed and inspired by this. Um, and I haven't yet had anybody say to me, you know, one of those feathers is out of place. Okay, <laughs> I oppose to this. <laughs> There we go. And these really kind of pull this way. So I'm going to make sure I get these. I'm going to bring your cat, the camera close so you can see one of these, how I'm doing this. There we go. Oops. There we go. So for example, this is basically the line, the shape that you want. And then I fill it in. And I'm leaving it dark at the top, you can see. That way it looks like it's blended and it's not a full shape. More or less. There we go. So we're getting these guys in here. I know the white's a little distracting and we'll get rid of that in the next few steps. And then down here, you can see after this pattern, it starts to blend in. And so you get these really kind of uniform brushes. And this is what I call a dry brush. So I've been painting with the same brush with paint on it throughout this area. And that means I'm losing paint and my paintbrush is drying a bit. I haven't added any of my water. And this is called a dry brush stroke. And that means it's just more softer and feathery. And let's see if I can capture this. And I'm basically just lightly brushing this on to create a bit of an illusion. So I'm not doing any kind of shapes. Like so. So you can see how you get, it's not as thick as say that guy. It's a little bit, it's called dry brush. And then I'm going into the shoulder and I check the shoulder, see what we have here. I've got this. I'm going to like Zoll. And then you have these amazing, what I call petals. They're just these rounded petals that round the shoulder out. And then you want to leave some of these black lines in there, like I was saying, so that this definition shows. And I do this pretty loosely, but it just comes from years of painting and practice. bunch of U forms. You can see I'm leaving black at the tops. And the U form and then just pull this out like that. You get a little natural fading happening. <clears throat> and then they start getting a bit longer when I judge the photo. See here, they're smaller up here and then they get longer. They're just beautiful. Ravens fascinate me. And of course, you can do this with almost any bird species. Oh, 
Hmm. And I'm going quite quickly because like I said, it's so dark, this navy blue uh, with black, it's very forgiving. There we go. And we're getting even longer ones. Now you can see, I can hear it actually when I paint, I can hear the dry brush. Now I'm losing paint on here, which I like to do these last little bits with. So you can just kind of get the last bit of paint off my brush by going like this. Oops, dropping everything today. Now, I'm just gonna check my shoulder here. So I've got a pretty flat shoulder, but you can see here, it's a little bit more rounded. So I'm gonna bring in a few more details. And these are literally just brush strokes. Look at that, blunk, blunk. Sound effects are free. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna let that dry and we can talk a little bit about um, some of the questions. So, let me turn that for a second. Okay, so we were talking about, so there was a question about photos and uh, excellent question um, when you're a photo-based artist. So here's what I've learned over the years being an artist. So when you're practicing, um, you can basically, use any photo you want whether you find it in a magazine or a book or online um, for practice purposes and um, soon as you over time get to a point where you have a finished painting that you attach some kind of evaluation to and that means you sell it you show it in an art show you even trade it and believe it or not even if you gift it to someone as soon as it's out of your little workspace and its purposes are no longer to teach you and it's not practice anymore, there's a value that, a perceived value. So even as a gift, I give Cynthia a painting that I've done, it's out of my workspace and I've put a value, I've valued it as a gift. And it's now, she might put it on display, she might put it up in her home. Now there's a value attached to it. And so photos, like I said, you can use them for your practicing, as soon as that happens and you, you put an evaluation on it, put in an art show, even a community, smaller community art show, there's gonna be some issues. So photos can be followed for practice. You have intention to kind of join a show or you know, display your work, then there's a whole kind of system of copyright that you have to follow. And what I've done over the years is I contact professional photographers and ask permission. And some photographers are like, yeah, you betcha, no problem. I'll sometimes send them a little gift, a little print to honor that permission. And then others have fees. And I've come across $50, $100 permission fee, and sometimes $500, sometimes $3,000. And rightly so. I mean, the, of all the images that are out there, I've found, like, of course, the best images are by professional artists, and they're making art as well. And they put tireless hours into their work. And um, so, I want to honor that and, and there's also stock images stock photographers and you, you pay for the usage of that so i pay about a hundred dollars for the use of a photo and um and yeah so that's the photo question i hope that answers that, that. and um, um there are some interesting kind of um not gaps but if the painting resembles the photo that's where you have these copyright issues. For some artists that are much more abstracted and, and much more expressive, they can use photo sources as long as it's the original photo can't be denied in there. You know, some people will use photos of faces and human form, and yet their, their end paintings do not hold that image inside it, if that makes sense. So a little bit of freedom there because you're interpreting and changing um, that image so dramatically that you're just using it as an intellectual and creative source. Um, question about brushes. I'm so excited. I love brushes. <laughs> and, uh, I want to share with you my three brushes. I have lots of brushes, but these ones are my favorite. So these ones are called cap tongues because they're shaped, as you can see, they're rounded. And this is a half inch cat tongue. Love these brushes. Um, these are by Liquitex and the 
series number, they called it the Gold Sable 880. And can be found in most art supply stores, but you're looking for what's called a cat's tongue. And I use, this is the one I use the most. This is teeny little quarter inch cat tongue. I don't know if you can see that. Most of my paintings, large and small, is this little guy. This is my little work engine. And then to do fine work, I use this teeny little brush. This is also a Liquitex Series 700. And it's tiny. And this is what I do the eyes with and the little lines in the beak, all the fine, fine details. So I have so many brushes, but these are the ones that I typically use. Um, and what I wanted to share with you is the importance of your brushes. So after all these years of painting, your paint's very important for sure. Um, your subject, your canvas is important, but the most important in my view are your brushes. And like anything, sports, gardening, any other activity, the better your equipment and the better you know your equipment, your tools, the more success you have painting. And it's taken me years to kind of really learn how these brushes work. I know that sounds silly. People kind of think it's like, put it in paint, do that. Oh no, my friend. <laughs> All brushes are not created equal. So take this little guy, for example. He's just poker straight. And compared to this guy. This guy is also poker straight, but you can see how long, much longer his bristles are. The longer the bristle, the harder to control because when you're pressing it down, it bends and fans out. So it's longer, you'll have a longer, like a wider fan out, see that? And for me, that's harder to control. So even though these are fairly close to each other, the major difference is these guys are short. So when it's pressed down, it doesn't fan out as much. I don't know if you can see that. So you have really great, great control. So even huge murals that I've done, I'm in there with my little brushes. The first mural I ever did, I went and bought, spent a whole bunch of money on these big commercial brushes because I thought large format, 10 foot painting, need, never touch them. I use these guys. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, I will use, I will use these other ones from time to time for washes and stuff. So this is an angled brush. Use that. I find them a little bit harder to control because they fan out quite a bit and cool ones. I bought this one just because it looks cool, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> and again, compare these two. This one, they're both angled brushes. There we go. But see how long this one is? They're harder to control. They'll fan out a lot more. And when you wanna do really fine details, I find these shorter, stubbier ones much, much easier to control. Um, so back to my favorite all-time brush, the next pause that I'll do, I'll, I'm going to show some markings. And this is not only rounded at the tip, so you get perfect, like when you go in for your stroke, you have a rounded pit, tip, and then you can pull that stroke. So you're putting, your, I call it the entry point. So if I just kind of turn my canvas here, camera here, you go in for your entry point, you can see the angle I'm putting that brush on, you get that rounded starting point with your stroke and how you pull your stroke away will dictate the stroke pattern. And what I do with this is not, not only is it rounded, but it's flat. So when you turn it sideways, this is the width of line you can get. I love this brush. So I can do a lot of fine work by turning that sideways and painting that way, turning it again and getting a fatter one. And then when you get really good and you spend a lot of time, you go in with your cat's tongue, get a nice wide starting. And then you, when you're pulling your stroke away, you turn the brush, right? So <laughs> anyways, brush strokes are so exciting. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and remove this white chalk. And um, I have... Leah, there were a couple of questions. Should I save them till the next break? Uh, feel free. You can tell me right now if you like. Okay, uh, there's a question um, about the paints you use again. She's hoping you could show us again and maybe that could be later. She says she has trouble. Yeah. This is Naomi. She has trouble with acrylics drying too fast and was wondering if you add retarder or open medium to increase drying time. Yes. Yes, I'm going to answer those excellent questions. Excellent questions. The struggle is real. And I forgot to paint my little eye. So I'm going to go in with my tiny brush. And I'm going to remove a little bit of chalk above it. Like that, dissolve that. 
when you dissolve the chalk with a wet brush, and I used a clean container of water, and I just used a nice wide wet brush to remove the chalk, it does get a little chalky, milky on there. So sometimes I'll come in and, and use a, a paper towel. Well, actually, if, like a, a cotton tea towel would be better because paper towel will leave little shards of paper and it just, you can't get them off. Um, these canvases are kind of rough to the touch. And that's another little tip when you're painting. Certainly you can't do it with linen, but when you're painting on a primed canvas, it's actually quite rough. And many artists will sand that with a fine piece of sandpaper and just going lightly. And that makes your strokes so much easier. I used to do that as well when I was learning and it really improved the control of the brush strokes. So consider a light sand and then wiping off the dust. But now after all these years, I'm kind of used to how rough the canvases are and I can accommodate that. But people starting out, it can be a little tough. So you might want to sand that down. And I'm gonna go in and do my eye rim. All these beautiful dots. There we go. Now while that's drying, I'm gonna continue taking this chalk off. nice thing about acrylic is if you make a mistake you can add black in you know if you can add anything that's what, why I love acrylic is that it's um semi transparent mostly you can make it an opaque layer it's nice and dark and it's, you can just cover it with more paint as opposed to watercolor which is far more unforgiving and I haven't tried oils yet it just I, I'm really interested to try oils but I do like the quick drying time of um acrylic I'm really impatient and I'm just going to use this paper towel here to dab off some of the water. There we go. And that's still drying. Oh, I don't know if you guys can see that. I'll bring my camera up close so you can see how that looks. Yeah, still have the pencil in there. I'm going to wash that off. This is basically where we're at. It looks great already, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna do the next layer and then we'll talk some more about some of the paint, which I just love to talk about. So I'm gonna go back into my palette. And we have this paint that we previously mixed. I'm just going to squirt it a little bit. That helps with some of the drying time. This is a really great little spritzer on very fine mist. And then I'm going to add, so here's my paints. I'm going to add, and I need a little bit of white, so I'll bring that over. I think I'm going to go into the turquoise. I am adding a little bit on the edge here. I don't put it right into the thing typically because I want to control how much I bring in there. Oops, maybe a little bit more. I always over pour. Now some white. Da -da -da. Oops. Okay. That's my. That's my turquoise. You can maybe see the slight difference to the Payne's gray. And we're going to go through that. I'm going to show you what these colors really look like um, a little bit later. It's pretty cool. So I'm going to bring that into the original mixture. And I'm going to add a little bit of white. See how fast that changed? Look how beautiful that is. Just incredible. It's very powerful, this, this phthalo turquoise. It took me a long time. I'm still learning how to control it. Now, I don't want to go too light, so I do many layers, each one just slightly lighter than the next. It's, it's not this, there's a bit of patience that happens, even though I'm preparing to do a whole little raven in two hours. <laughs> there's this, and I'm just going a little bit lighter. There we go. See the contrast, just a, just a hint better, lighter than the first layer. I'm going to go in with my trusted little cat's tongue. So now I'm looking at this photo and I'm starting to concentrate on what are the highlights. Along the beak line here, I'm looking at the beak here. There's tiny little lines in here, which I'll do with my tiny brush. You can see his forehead's lighter. So I'm gonna keep some of these in here 
because this is nice and dark, but there's see there's some definition, but I think that's captured nicely with this dark navy blue. Likewise to here, I'm gonna leave that like this and maybe some of this part. So I'm focusing now on these lighter bits. So I'm gonna take you with me here. And get my glasses out of the way. I never cover the whole beak entirely, just because you can see there's really nice texture in here. It's never a solid color. So I really find this process really enjoyable. There's no mistakes really. And just kind of like, see what I'm doing here. I'm just adding a few, leaving some of the color below to show through, some of the black to show through like that. The one important thing is I really try to keep my line straight for going along the mouth. Otherwise he looks like he has a crooked mouth which some beaks are, but for creating illusion. I don't know if you can see this. I'm gonna pull this nicely along here, nice and straight there. And I do see this top beak is much lighter than the bottom one. So I don't necessarily have to do as much. The angle of my brush is really important. If I was to go like this sideways, I just wouldn't have that same control. So I'm coming in at, at it at an angle like this and that sharpens my point. So I don't bloop out into that. And you can see there's just a wee bit of really cool texture in here. It's not solid. So I'm just gonna do these random lines. Da, da, da. And then this is one of my favorite parts. See all these really tiny lines in here. There we go. I always like this area, a little bit thicker here. You can see it's a little bit thicker here, that guy. And it goes into a thin line. There we go, nice and loose. I'm gonna switch into my, I don't know if this handheld option is working for you guys. There we go. So I'm gonna follow my original lines, just highlighting that. There we go. See it's starting to take shape. I'm gonna go back in here and see these guys. I call this the little valley, the forehead valley. So I'm gonna try and create that. Oops, get my hand out of the way. While I'm here, I'm gonna come into the eye. Just gonna do that for now. And then all these little dots, the eyes are my favorite. Check this out. I don't know if you can see that. The eye rim is all this collection of little dots, little, little nubs that are in there. And I just find them the most beautiful part of the weaving. Oh. See that a little bit of so now I'm examining what are these lighter shapes? Where are the highlights? See the difference between this area and how it's a little bit lighter here and ultimately a little bit lighter here. So every layer we're gonna add some white and that's gonna get lighter and lighter. Okay. I kind of crisscross onto the next layer and that's how you get depth. If you were to copy exactly what you did before, then you lose some depth and the navy you can't see, but the navy, is showing through. The black is showing through still. And I'm going to examine this again and you can see how it does fade. So I'm not going to pull this lighter all the way down. I'm just going to do 
Oops, helps if I put the camera on there. Back at my photo. Turned the brush sideways so that I can get a really nice fine line. See the difference between that stroke, like this, oink, oink, to this, turning it sideways. It's an amazing brush. Yeah, it's coming. Now, there's a few. This is where this little brush is so perfect. So check this out. The round tip of it, all you do is touch it, pull it lightly. Overlap them. At least some of them showing. Now they get longer. And turning it sideways again so I can get a nice fine line. I don't go right to the end because you can see it fades out. There's a little highlight around the cheek, which I'll do down here. And so this is where the brush, I'm coming in on, on the side, but I can press it harder and see how it fattens out. So I can get a fat start and then pull it. If that makes sense. Now, this part here I want to capture. So I'm going to go back into for some more paint. And this is where I'm going to turn it to the, the wide part and just put it on a slight angle. So if I went straight across, you'd see how wide that is. It's kind of nice. But I'm going to put it on a slight angle and then pull it. It's just slightly more narrow. So you see, I can kind of made this highlight cheek come out a little bit. Super fine, turn on its side. That's those guys. More paint, I'm gonna do these spiky bits. So they're lighter at the ends and they go darker as it gets closer to the skin of the raven. So I'm gonna start at the bottoms of these spiky ones. Brushes turn sideways. This is also a good spot to do the teeny little brush. You see how, because this brush is rounded, you do get this little rounding. See that there, it's a rounded, rounded tip. And if I wanna to switch to the more fine brush, have a little bit more control. You can see how that starts. It's much more pointed than these rounded parts. There we go. So for our beautiful breast feathers, they're, like I was saying, they're so pointed at the end. So I'm gonna go through and do just the pointed bottoms of them first. Like that. And then I just kind of fill in a little bit, make sure they fade as they go up so that you're not covering the whole thing. Cause then it'll look like, you know, it's not as realistic in these big, fat petals that are on the raven. This is a little time consuming, um, but it's worth it, worth it in the end. Like so. All right. And I just have to do this for a few of them to create that illusion. You don't have to do it for all of them. And it's really important when you're mixing your color, like if these 
that these were much brighter and I struggled with that when I started painting it was like I put and I always do a test I didn't do that this time but I always do after I mix a color I go okay and it's going to pick a spot here that I know is going to be really light and I'll do that much and then you step back and you realize ah oh, it's way too light you, for me how I paint is I like gradual uh, layers and that's how I get depth if you jump too light too fast and skip a few layers you might ask yourself like why why can't I get that the depth like it's actually coming off the canvas at me it'll look like a painted raven rather than wow this this painting of a raven has a heartbeat it's actually talking to me <laughs> that's the trick is just many layers with a little bit more white in each there we go few more oops and the nice thing is with this brush being so fine when I pull the paint up like this it's not heavy. I get a nice little feathering, like a little hair strands. So when you step back, it looks so soft. So you don't want a nice solid line there, a demarcation line. You just want to come in, oops, and pull them like that. Hope that makes sense. And now one more, this little guy. So I've done a few of them and the other ones I'm going to do a little bit looser with the bigger brush because this is the drama area and I'm going to go in and just do some of my little some of these little feathers there we go and I'm going to spritz my palette again a little bit of water Okay, now, just doing a little bit in this area. See how it's kind of highlighted in here? So I have some nice lines already. I'm just gonna add a little bit. It's like joining this section with this section. Just a wee bit. So you can see this brush is so amazing. See how it comes in perfectly rounded. I pull it and it's pretty much the shape of these. See all the people that have followed my work and you think I labor over all these feathers and it's like the brush does it. So I take the brush, depress it extra for this entry point like that, and pull. Bonk. Now I've spent many years practicing, so I make it look easy maybe. I've got some dry brush there. Excellent. Now I'm going to go into the shoulder. Just going to recap here. And this is, I don't want to cover what I've done. So you can see I've left some of the navy to show. I'm going to start accentuating these petals. Doing the bottom parts of them. And then I go in and just blend them a little bit. So you don't have this kind of of these noodles, these little macaroni noodles sitting there. A little bit of feathering, but not covering your navy. See that? There's your original. 
navy blue, which was the Payne's gray. Highlight that edge and then feather out a little bit. Might look like I'm covering what I did before, but I am leaving some of the darker parts. There, stepping back, I'm going to blend some of these a little bit so they're not just floating by themselves. There, what do you think? It's coming along. So I'll just let that dry and I can answer some more questions. So now I had a question about paint and, um, and how to keep paint wet, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Let me just turn this guy real quick. Okay, so I wanted to share my favorite all-time paint is obviously the Golden brand. And I stopped using tube acrylics years ago. Um, this is called a fluid acrylic, fluid acrylics. It's very liquidy. So tube paint kind of has the consistency of toothpaste when you squeeze it out and then you have to add either additives or water and mix it so you can get a brushable flowing you can do a nice brush stroke um, for some artists to paint is important because they want that thing called impasto where they have ridges of paint that are left in the strokes so this wouldn't work for them they prefer the tube for me this is a nice liquidy creamy consistency already so it omits that level for me of having to to add water to a tube paint and get this kind of nice liquidy level. Um, you can see how easily it kind of goes on and um, the keeping, yeah, acrylics dry very, very quickly. I've experimented in the past with additives. There's, there is an additive, there's two. I just, re I realized I recently um, came upon a new golden product, which I've forgotten the name of. Um, but the, the, the one that I've used in the past is called a retarder and it's clear, you add it to to your palette um, and mix it in and you can use a little bit of water it's supposed to to slow the drying time and so there's other products like that that will actually slow the drying time i don't use them um, i have some of them and i've experimented with them um, but i guess i just i'm not sure why um, i just found a little bit more success with water and coming up with the consistency i need i end up working really fast um so that might be it when i was starting out it was a lot slower and i would struggle with that dry brush in one stroke you can actually start with wet paint and by the time you've pulled out your stroke it's it breaks up because it's drier and it's very frustrating it's hard to get a nice it's not like oil that's wet all the time so try some of those um additives there's also called something called a gloss medium and a matte medium and these mediums have a variety of thicknesses, so you can have really thick, pasty paint uh, additive to add to your paint, and that'll give you more depth and texture if you want. And then there's thinner ones. The, the thing is with those is matte will dry matte, and the gloss dry gloss, and the gloss I find dries super gloss, um, so I haven't really used those too much. Uh, I do have that little spritzer bottle that keeps my palette a little bit wet, which is nice, and I'm always moving the palette around. But I wanted to say, that I found when I switched to golden, um, the those issues of drying time and stroke quality really improved. So when you're starting out, you'll use kind of like student quality paints, and it's all about how paint is made. And golden's considered an artist quality 
top of the line type of paint. And all paints come from a powdered pigment, which comes from a variety of you know sources, plant materials and minerals. And they take this powder, this pigmented powder, and they'll add what's called a carrier. And they'll add this and then mix it up. And then you have your tube paint or your liquid paint. And these higher end paints use just a better quality of carrier and a better quality of powder. The powder is mixed much more finely. And I, I can remember when I was starting out and I was using student quality, which is great for learning, great for practicing. And you pull your brush across, you could see little fine little almost sand bits and 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 you go oh well, I don't want that you know so the the grit it's a little bit grittier these kind of student quality paints um and if you develop a real interest in painting then I really strongly suggest you eventually invest in these high-end paints and you'll see this difference and like I said before it's like skiing gardening anything that you know some kind of craft when you have better tools it just cuts out a lot of frustration for you and you're just going to find that you're going to ski better garden better everything and you're going to paint, paint better um but it does take time i didn't have all that that stuff when i first started out so i hope that answers the question um the drying time is tricky and i've day dreamt about going into oils for that reason <laughs> and so i blend more and i do layers so i don't actively blend on the canvas which some uh acrylic painters will do um i found when i try to do that if you over mix acrylics they get what's called mudded so the colors start to to break down a little bit so if you have one color and you're blending on the actual painting you can get a flattening of your vibrant color and so i don't do that this is just teaching how i paint and i just do layers upon layers upon layers each one has its own color and i hope that helps to answer that question. Yeah, there is a question um, from Jocelyn. She just asks if all the paints you use are fluid. Yes. <laughs> yes, I still have some tube paints, but I haven't used them for years. Uh, I just love this, these fluid paints. They're just beautiful consistency. And like I said, every brand's different. You gotta find which one you like. There's a number of top line paints and I just really love the golden fluid acrylics. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna mix the next layer, I think. I'm gonna see if I can get the white off the eye. Turn you back over here. There we go. And I did it with the pencil. It doesn't come off as nicely as the chalk. Look at that. I actually cooperated this time. Yay. So I'm gonna show you what we have with the eye now that the pencil's off. There we go. Look at that beauty. Okay, so let me just put you down here for a second. I am going to move away from, am I going to go the teal route? Okay, I'm going to go a little bit later with the, te the teal. Oh, let me bring you with me. So I still have some white there, and that's why I didn't pull all that white in so that I can have some left over. And I'm going to pull that white into. My mixture and on the next break I'm going to talk about the power of black and white paint holy moly look how bright this gets compared to our last layer this is our last layer color this was our previous layer color over here bam white just will pop that out and often I have to end, add more pigment again and get more black in there darken it again so it's like ah the white just blew it blew it off the charts. See, I'm doing that just now. I'm pulling some of this teal in and some of this black in. Like I said, the way I paint, I just do subtle changes each layer. I don't go super bright with the next layer. There we go. I think that'll be good. I'm gonna do a tester. Let's do a random tester. I always do a tester where I know there's going to be a really light, really light, light spot. So it'll get covered if I don't like it. And let's see how bright we are. It looks good through the camera, but actually it's not, it's not showing a big difference. If I pull back, you can see it's popping a little bit. It's popping a little bit, but not quite enough. I'm very close. So I'm just going to mix a little bit more. 
I think I'm satisfied with that. Okay. So you see the beak's quite light. Then you've got this beautiful beak line. I'm going to focus on that. Oops. I'm going in all different directions here. That's called texture. I'm being careful to keep some of my previous layers showing. Now I'm going to go right to the edge. I am. Because no raven is outlined in black in reality. <laughs> nice and solid. There we go. Now this bottom one, it's one of my favorites, the bottom beak. because There's just a little highlight here and it's a little bit lighter here. So I get to keep all this beautiful kind of brushwork. I did. Might do a few dots in there and join them with a line because it's irregular, isn't it? Beaks are chipped and jagged sometimes. And wider there. And then this is all scratches and stuff on the beak. I just find it fascinating. Like there's just the story that Raven's beaks can tell if they've been in fights, if they've been foraging, what kind of life they've had and they all have this interesting patterns on there. So I'm trying to mimic that by doing a few short strokes in order to get some of this texture in here. Let's see these beautiful little baby ones. I'm gonna to switch to my fine brush for that. There we go. Never following the previous strokes perfectly. Oops. My friend Lexi's better at this than I am. She does these two pays very nicely. Now I'm going to go into the valley in here. Let's add a few little strokes in there. Little dots. And then I'm going to go into the eye. You can see here the eye has this lighter rim around this highlight, and that's where I'm going to copy. Let's see if I can get that. There's a few lines in there. Not doing it perfectly. There, it looks weird close up, but I need to step back. Ta -da! I'm going to switch to my favorite cat's tongue. And use this perfect shape that I love. Look at that. Bam, 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 bam. Turning it a little bit so that they start straightening. Dun, dun, the best. And some highlight along here. These guys. What do you think, Cecilia? They're looking good. I'm turning my brush sideways again to get a fine line. So I'm going to blend. You don't want things to just stop. So and the next part I'm going to do is in here. See, it's this definition of this beak here at the bottom. Okay. Now, the ear plate. I'm not covering everything perfectly. Actually, doing a few less. So, you don't want them to have like a polka dotted cheek. Just kind of lightly doing this. 
See that perfect strokes in my book. That's this brush, turning it sideways and then pulling. And how I'm holding my hand, you can see my pinky is, is actually bracing the canvas. You can't lean on the canvas too much because it'll warp and bend. It's very fragile. But I've learned over the years how to kind of hold my, my weight and balance by touching the canvas ever so lightly. I don't, I, sometimes I'll, in the bigger paintings, I'll hold my brush away like this, but these finer strokes, this is what I'm doing. I'm using that pinky to kind of manipulate my hand. Like that. Or resting my palm just lightly on there. This is how your arm is tense the entire time because you're not physically leaning on the canvas, but it's like you're just doing an air pressure. Brushes turn sideways, get the perfect strokes. Best brush ever. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to go into these guys. Remember, we did the fine brush. I'm just going to use my cat's tongue here. Oops. Let me know if a camera wanders off. So you can see I'm doing just these strokes of the point like that and like that, and then just turning my brush slightly and just doing like one feather. And we did a whole bunch of little ones with the smaller brush. Now I can get away with one. Just the tips of these long strokes. Oh yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna go into the shoulder here. A little bit of feathering. The next layer will be brighter and I'm gonna do very little on these. It's basically painting the same thing over and over, less and less, covering less and less area, really, the way I do it. Is that pinky? Pinky is everything. A little bit of feathering, a little bit of blending. I looked back and decided these don't have as much weight. I was looking kind of flat there. I was doing all of the feathers with the same treatment. So now I'm trying to fill in a little bit like that. So it looks a little bit more rounded, right? We'll do a little bit in here, not much. There we go. Cool. 
Bam. Okay. Just gonna let that dry and have any questions. Dry. Okay, so there was a question about uh, photos from the conversation about photo uh, copyright. Um, it was a question about whether when you purchase the photo and display of the painting in a gallery, do you still credit uh, the reference on the label info? Um, it depends on who you've paid. So if you have paid a uh, permission fee from a professional photographer, that's something that you discuss with that particular person. Um, everyone's different. And so some photographers are like that I've talked to, they're like, no, nope, use it, no problem. And here's your fee and, and others you do. So I'd say the best practices is to do that. If your painting is very close to that photo, yeah, I would give credit to the photographer. Um, typically with stock images through your payment, you're kind of, um, you don't necessarily have to put their, your name, their name along with yours if it's a painting. Okay, any other questions? There is a question here from Cecilia. Um, she says, what do I do when there's a hole or rip in the canvas? I painted Ooh. something and it has a rip in it. Do I paint over it? Okay, good question. Um, depends on how big this rip is. If we're talking like a narrow long one. There's um, a medium that you can use, which is like, uh, it's called matte medium or gloss medium, which we were talking about earlier. And I think I haven't come across this. So um, you can mend that from the back side. And, and so instead of painting the front to fill it, paint it from the back to fill it um, with this kind of clear medium. Um, paint will be, can act like a glue because it's a latex, it's acrylic, but I would get a little bit more of the medium because it's really bonding. Um, that should maybe close that gap in your tear. Um, and then you can come in the front and paint over it. I think that's how I would handle it. But I wanted to pass a really cool tip that has saved me so many times. So I wanted to show this blank canvas. I want to show, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, can you see my finger? This is how sensitive, these, essentially it's a square drum. But they are so sensitive that if you move your canvas and you're handling your canvas, even if you put your thumb on the front because you want to grab this wooden frame to move it, if you're grabbing it like this, your thumb can actually leave a little depression on there. And so you can have your art in a show and you're like at different angles of the light, you're like, what's, where'd that come from? And if you have any dent, if it's leaning up against something, like it'll show on here. If you have a piece of cardboard that's a little heavy leaning against your canvas, say you've got your canvas in storage, it'll leave a linear line on there, a little depression, it'll, it'll show. So sensitive. I always pack my canvases um, like this. These two are packed together and they are face to face. So you can see that sensitive fronts protect each other. So I always stack the paintings face to face, make sure the frames are touching. And um, if you have a big canvas and a little canvas face to face, that little canvas will make a depression on the bigger canvas. So this is what you do. This spray bottle, and this works only if you have a canvas that is raw. You see the different color? This is a natural, this is what the canvas actually looks like without the white gesso, the primer. And the primer is what makes it paintable. And this is natural canvas material, cotton. And if you paint it on this side, it would bleed. But um, you go onto the back of your canvas, say you have a little dent in here, little, you spritz the back evenly, very evenly with fine mist, and you watch it disappear. It's Phenomenal. I had a huge painting I was working on, which was five feet by seven feet, and it was in cooking hot summertime. It was in a studio I had this few blocks away in this old industrial building. And this five foot by seven foot canvas, I tend to prop up my canvases on paint cans so that the canvas isn't sitting flush on the floor. I need it a little bit higher. And I would stand up and paint like this, but it was sitting on these two paint cans and at an angle, so it doesn't tip off. So it's a nice angle, seven foot tall canvas. I came back three days later, I painted on this and it was going down to this gallery. There was lots of pressure. And I came in and I was like, 
where's my canvas? And it had somehow from the road traffic and vibrate, I don't know, I thought I had it at a very good angle, clearly I didn't. And it had fallen. The problem is I had a separate big paint can, like the big gallon paint cans that I used as a seat. I would sit in front of the canvas and kind of rest there and look at my thing. I didn't have a stool, <laughs> I used this paint can. And this canvas fell on top of this paint can. And three days later with the heat, I came in and I saw it on the floor and I was like, oh! and I could see through the back of the canvas that was, that was lying flat. I could see the actual paint can. It was round and all the fabric was, oh my goodness. I'm gonna say it was like four inches at least protruding. I was like, this is a disaster. And so I lifted up the paint, the canvas and it was just, it was awful. It was like literally like this, you know? This is your fabric. Brown. That's how it looked. <laughs> and I thought, I am, what am I going to do? And somehow I, somebody had told me this trick and it came to mind. And I thought, it can't. Something this drastic, it's never going to fix this. And I spritz, you spritz the whole back. You think about this, you're saturating one area and it pulls that canvas. And so I did a light covering all over, a little extra at the spot. And by the time I came around from the back, like, like that, I watched it. It was like, pow. No. Of course, some of the paint had chipped because it'd been three days. It was really hot. So the paint can stuck to it a bit. Man, so this is a great tip. I take this when I have art shows in case the paintings in transit are like a little loose dent. And if you sell a painting, you might have a client that goes, hi, we put our canvas up, our painting up, and it's, it's puckering. And that's just different levels of temperature in their house. I had a client that stored their painting in a closet while they renovated their thing and it buckled inside the closet and they were just mortified and I said don't worry I'll come over I'll spritz the back after they painted the room they actually brought the canvas out waiting for me to come and spritz the back for them because they're too afraid to do it <laughs> and uh, the atmosphere changed from a closet to the living room they woke up this next morning and they're like, oh, never mind, it's flat again. So this is fabric and it'll it'll be affected by heat and moisture. And so spray bottle. Okay, so I will go to the next thing. I'm going to the next layer. I have introduced this color. So that's this guy, cobalt blue. So I think the Raven's looking great the way it is. It's pretty teal but I like to add a little bit more color, a little bit more life. So I've gone into this cobalt, which is a kind of a purpley blue, periwinkle blue, if you will. And we'll I'll talk next about these colors. That'll be fun. Add a little bit of white. And then I typically have my paper towel right here. And so I'm always dabbing excess paint and, and water off my brush. That's how I get control. If you don't do that, then you're gonna have drips. It's gonna flick all over the place. So even as I mix this, before I go into the canvas, say I like this color, this is looking good. I always take a little bit extra off just because your, your, your brush is laden with paint. So I've, over the years, I've found a way that I like to do it. So always use your paper towel. Okay, so I'm gonna go in here, oops. Quite different, quite bold. So look what we have happening. Drama, I love it. Now I'm gonna leave a lot of my background. This is gonna create depth. Like that. Right. Going much lighter here than I have previously. Almost feathering it. Very light, barely touching the canvas. That's where you get these really cool strokes. And I, I rely on that to kind of, you know, not every stroke has to be super heavy. So these light, feathery, very light strokes, I think create an amazing illusion. Oh yeah. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go into here.
I almost have too much water in there. You can see how it's pooling a little bit. So I'm gonna go over it again. There we go. Miracle brush. So you can see how I'm following what I did before, but I'm shortening. Last time I went to here, the next time I came to here, the next lighter one I went to here, and now I'm stopping here. Uh, yeah. You're really just doing some choice ones. You're not covering all of them, just a few choice ones. And that gives them this highlighted look. And then a little bit here, teeny ones, little dots. So similar strokes, but I'm not pulling them as long. I gotta shake my hand. My hand's doing this weird <laughs> thing. This level of highlight's my favorite because look at that, you start getting the drama. And as promised, you don't have to do the feathering on these ones. You could do a few, but. See that? I'm just gonna blend a few of them, the bigger ones. Now I'm noticing here that these have some overlap and I have quite a nice distinction line. So I'm gonna try and follow the photo a little bit better there and pull some of these in. Bam, 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 bam. Yep, this does take practice. <laughs> Probably won't get this in the first try. There. I'm rather pleased with that. I'm gonna go back into the mouth here in the beak. I'm doing really fine lines here. I've noticed this is how I kind of capture the scratches that are on the beak. There. Darn it, let's do the toupee. The toupee I leave for the end because it actually Takes a while to do this. I'm only gonna do the top part up here where the light might be shining on it. Like that. A little tough to do because your paint is wet around you and you can end up like this. <laughs> so what happens, since I rest my hand on that canvas lately, I get that. And what's happened to me is I will go and rest my hand somewhere else and I'll get a blooch and be like, how did that happen? So be careful about that. 
Okay, I was gonna show you some of these paints while that's drying. Um, I have this blank canvas and I wanted to show, this is my Payne's Gray. I think it's misnamed because it's like a deep navy blue. I call it indigo. Um, and each different maker of paint, their Payne's Gray is slightly different. You know, they'll have much more of a gray, blue gray. And Golden's is fairly blue, I like that. And um, now I'm going to put on here the turquoise thalo, thalo, I call it teal. And put that there. Cobalt blue, which is a color I've just recently started using for my ravens. And then sometimes, especially on the larger ones, ones where I have much more space, I bring in this guy, ultramarine violet. Ah, and there's this guy, dioxazine purple. So some of my ravens, instead of teal and blues, I'll do a blue and purple. I just want to show you this. This is pretty cool. Let me see where I can put this. Give me one second. Okay. Okay, so I did some dots here. This is our Payne's Gray. See how some of these, this is the dioxazine purple. This is the turquoise, the Thalo turquoise, and this is the Payne's Gray. And when you put them out on your palette, they all look black. They're, you could barely tell the difference between these, these two and this one. These ones, obviously cobalt blue, you can tell, and even the purple, you can kind of tell, but this is very, very dark. This is very, very dark, and this is very, very dark, but adding water and certainly adding white, you're gonna see the true nature of this color. So here we are with the Payne's Gray, watch this. Look how blue that is. Isn't that beautiful? So the more water you add to your brush stroke, it's more watery, you'll get a lighter. The more paint you have, you get more of it's darker. So you can control it with your water. If you're working upright like I am, then you'll get drips. So just be careful with that. And so now is the, this is one of my favorite, check this out. This is the turquoise thalo. Whoa. Isn't that amazing? So this is on a white canvas. We're adding water and you'll get this look if you add white, these lighter, lighter, beautiful, very vibrant colors. Next one is this dark dioxazine purple. Look at that. Power, powerful. I obviously love painting. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the cobalt blue. And this last guy is the ultramarine violet. Very similar to the dioxazine purple. Just a shade off, a little bit different. So these are the colors that I use with my raven painting. Put that down there. Okay. Now we we'll get back into the raven. I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm going to bring in this color. This is a burnt sienna. It's a red brown. See? I'm only going to put a wee little dot on here. A little new palette here. Like the size of half a dime, a quarter inch, just a little dot. Um, and then I'm going to take my other cat's tongue, which is half inch, it's bigger, haven't used it yet. And I'm going to use this as a wash. So I'm not going to get a solid, you know, if you can see this, I'm adding water to the edge of it. That way I can control, I can't just put it right on, but I can add it to the edge 
And I'm watering this down. I want to add enough water to get a wash like this, but not so wet that it'll drip down my painting. And that takes time to figure out. And I still mess that up from time to time. But I like to put a little brown. So we have a lot of blues in here, a lot of strong colors. And this little wash in a few spots on the raven adds depth, adds warmth. I don't know how it works, but it's like it's my little secret, secret uh, technique. And I'll put that possibly a little bit on the beak. And yes, I'm flattening out some of that color. Let me see if I can bring this closer so you can see. See that? Flattens the color a little bit, but it's looking more like a natural creature. And I'll just put it in certain spots around here. You can see that around here. Yeah, it's kind of the counter to the blues and gives it more realism in my view. A little bit through here, just odd spots. Ah, the wing will be nice. I forgot to add a highlight to the wing. Look how dark it is compared to our. Very thin. But we're getting some three dimensionality here, I think. head here. There we go. I'm also while it's wet and fresh, I'm going to use this. This is the burnt sienna. I'm going to use my fine brush. Solid. I'm not going to water it down. I'm going to take from the solid part. And I'm going to come in and do this eye. Okay, this is my eye trick. So I've got the lighter part here. And then what I do is I kind of pull this in, do one stroke like that. I take the, wash my brush, remove the paint, and I remove a lot of the water, and I'm just gonna blend it a little bit, like that. There. So you can see this eye is starting to have depth. It's starting to have a little bit of life. We're gonna add more to that eye shortly. And, while I have that purple or that cobalt blue with white still mixed from this highlight, I'm just add to the shoulder a bit here. This takes time to master. I'm probably making it look like I'm just flicking things around, but the key is to just add a little highlight to each little crescent moon that you've made, just like that. Ta-da! Right? There we go. So I feel like that brown that I put around here pops that cheek plate out a bit more, just adds some warmth to, now it's got a little bit of a heartbeat, I think. And I'm gonna go into the eye, I'm gonna introduce another color, which is yellow ochre. Seal shut. There we go. Add it over here beside my brown. Little dot. And I'm gonna take, get all the water off my brush. I'm gonna take a little dab. See that? Just a wee little bit. Because I'm going to add this yellow to the eye. So these wonderful little dot pattern. See how these under here are a little bit lighter than 
those ones. So those are the ones I'm going to kind of focus on as the bottom ones. And this is where I get much more exact, where before I kind of put a loose pattern. Now I'm really focusing on where I'm putting these dots. I join a few of them like that. Now that I'm losing a bit of paint, I can go lighter up on here like that. I go back in for some more. Oops. Ta da! So you can see, I left the top a little bit more thinner and a little bit more bold at the bottom. Now that my brown has, I'm going to mix this yellow with a little bit of my brown. That's how I get this kind of orangey yellow. And I'm going to add, take off a lot of paint. I'm going to add just a wee bit of a touch to the eye like that. Right. I have a little bit extra, so I'm going to come in and bring out some of these guys with a little bit of yellow. There's really no yellow in a raven's beak, but this is my tricks. Go, and I'll show I'll show you how that works. So I did these lines, but I'm going to just blend this. This is a blank brush with a bit of water on it. There we go. Too much water. I'm getting a lot of character in here. I'm gonna add a little yellow to these guys. It's a little too purpley for me. I'm gonna be covering them, so it's not gonna look like that exactly, but anyways, we're getting there. Okay. We're almost finished, you guys. So I'm gonna go into my palette. So I have these teals that I've worked with white. I have the cobalt blue and I'm gonna go in with a little bit of cobalt blue and a little bit brighter white. Not perfect white, not yet. I've got this lighter, a little bit lighter cobalt that I've taken from here to here. And this is where I'm gonna come in and see how this pattern here, it's not white all the way through, it's kind of brighter in here there's some neat lines and for me the eye is everything so i'm gonna just take that very fine little line this trail it off right there we go now i like that so much i'm going to use that a bunch of scoop a bunch of white into my cobalt blue. This is going to be my final highlights for the feathers. Oh, yeah. Check that out. Loving it. These kind of finishing strokes that you just feather, it's taken me years to perfect those. So go easy on yourself if you're just starting. Highlighting the highlights. A few in here, teeny, teeny, teeny ones. Baby strokes, very end of this cheek plate. See that. Just a few highlights in here. Oops. Like 
that. Okay, I'm gonna do the toupee again, just a little bit up there. This is the top part. Back, too much water. See, it's starting to drip. That's my paper towel. Brother's calling me. Now, just a little extra drippy. See how it's kind of watery? I'm just going to dab that a little bit. There we go. I'm just not getting enough water off my brush. I gotta focus on that. Now, these guys, super fine. Teeny little brush. I'm doing these guys. Teeny little crack lines. We are almost done. Now, black and white is next. So I take my black. Give me one second, guys. Looks like I might be coming out of power, so I'm just gonna plug in. I didn't set this up beforehand, but I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. Let's put you down here for a second. And forgive me, I'm just gonna plug this in one second. Sorry about that. Learning all the time. All right, so I did a little dot of black. I'm taking my fine brush. Getting super excess water off. You don't want, you do not want this to be watery. Take as much moisture out of my brush, teeny little brush, baby dab. And this is kind of what my ravens are known for is the scruff. The scruff starts wide and then ends in a point. And this has taken me a long time to perfect, but 
It's fun to practice. And this is what makes ravens ravens, right? It's the scruff. And if your brush is too dry and if it's too wet, it will not work. You'll struggle and they'll be bloopy. Round that out. And typically they have them up here too. That's my favorite part. Okay, I've said that a few times. <laughs> There's many favorite parts to painting ravens. The smaller the brush for this, the better. Teeny little strokes. There we go. And if you mess up, you just make it a little bit wider like I just did. <laughs> okay, we're almost done guys. I'm going to take my white. I'm going to add it over here, actually. And over here, one little dot, just like that. I'm going to take my little tiny brush. Same thing, getting all the extra moisture off the paintbrush. One little dab. Just a wee bit on there. And this is my piece de resistance. Bam. And add a little bit of white to the beak. This is called super highlights. Very selective where you put this. See that? I'm gonna add a little bit to the bottom of the eye, wee tiny little dots. And almost all birds' eyes have these little dots. Too. Okay. I'm gonna observe this now and see where I might be needing just a wee bit more highlight just in these wrinkle feathers like that. Oh yeah, so exciting. Now this is where I've always over highlighted. <laughs> I've learned to pull back and if you're starting to paint ravens it might you might find that don't get frustrated it took me years and what I'd have to do is actually darken my raven again. I would always over highlight. So I'm learning restraint. You can always add more, but it's very hard to go back. It's not hard to go back, but it's, you know, it could be discouraging. There we go. I can't believe I painted a raven in under 20 in under two hours. <laughs> what do you guys think? Let me back up here. Ta -da! Little bit of yellow you can see in there. <laughs> right, Naomi, it's taken me years to this years of painting. So it's a little unfair to, to show, but anyways, I'm really happy that you guys kept me company because I, this little painting will be heading to possibly 
the gallery down south and today's my painting day. I hope you guys learned something from it and um, I wanted to share some of my techniques and how fast and rapid the brush strokes are. Like I said, it took me years to get to that point. And uh, please ask any questions. Thanks so much, Leah. Maybe um, I can just go back and ask some of the questions that were posted earlier. That sounds the great. Raven, the Raven is beautiful, by the way, and the comments uh, also support that. <laughs> um, so awesome. A couple of comments back here. Lorraine says, fascinating process. Leah, you're doing fabulous teaching method while holding phone on subject. Kudos. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> that was Tamara says, exhausted teacher here. This is so good for the soul. Just what I needed on a Saturday. Oh, yay. Yay. Thanks, Tamara. Uh, and then uh, Alexa, maybe I'll read. Yeah, Alexa earlier said, what does your artwork mean to you during this era in your art career? So kind of a general art question. Can you repeat that question? What does your artwork mean to you during this era in your art career? What does my art mean to me? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, my art has, is now and always has been just who, who I am. I've not ever been able to not paint or make stuff and I know other creatives are like that. And uh, sometimes in the past when I haven't been able to paint, I've glued things to other things. Like I'm just constantly creating. The brain is constantly envisioning really you know, cool and creative stuff. And right now I think I'm really enjoying the fact that I have spent 20 years painting. I can do a painting in two hours and all these strokes I feel confident with, you know, um, for the most part. And it's kind of fun now. I was really intimidated by painting. Every stroke would intimidate me and be like, oh, am I gonna ruin it? So I went through all that. And indeed I ruined it many times. And then I would paint it black again and start fresh. And that's just part of it. I find that so many people I run into, they want it to look like this the, right out of the gates. They're disappointed and they put their brushes down. They don't try. And I've been painting for years. And I've gone through that just recently. Am I able to kind of work this quickly and really know those strokes in that brush? And yeah, many times I was super discouraged. I come from a drawing background, so I find the way I paint is almost drawing with paint. So I really admire abstract artists and expressionist artists that really trust these strokes and drip painting. Like that's so cool. Um, but right now I'm really enjoying my painting because I feel I have a bit of a mastery over my tools now and just like any crazy fool I'm starting to change my style and not in this particular one but the one I showed you at the very beginning with loops and I'm so isn't that funny you work so hard to reach kind of an apex of where you're like yeah I'm just killing it and then you're like I'm gonna change everything so now in that new work I feel right at the back at where you guys might be where like I'm intimidated I don't know if this looks good I'm unsure of every stroke <laughs> And I'm thinking, why am I doing this to myself? I finally have come to a place where I can be like, oh, but I guess we're always growing as artists and always learning and never give up. Remember that paint is just supposed to be fun. And like I said, that's one thing majorly I come across with people is they have this benchmark, like it has to look this, and it has, especially if you're painting from a photo, oh, it has to. That didn't happen for me. I, it took me years to get to this place. You've got to enjoy it. Paintings meditative and fun, put some music on, snowy day like today. I just, it's, it's how I prefer to spend my time. So it's a really great close companion to me, I guess now at this stage of my career. It's not just objects I'm painting, these are my friends. <laughs> this is, I'm bonded to this process, if that makes any sense. Nice, thanks. I think you answered that question very well. Um, no. Simone comments, uh, she said, I'm amazed at how much your paintbrush holds. I don't know if you have a response to that, but I thought that was an interesting comment. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's changed over time. When I was first starting and kind of a middle level artist, I couldn't get that. And so I think that's come with time. Like I've been able to, without realizing it, 
hold the brush a certain way, dip the brush a certain way, get enough water. Because the brushes are made so that even synthetic brushes have these microscopic barbs on the brush. And natural barbs have it. So if you put your own hair under a microscope, you have these little tiny, and that's what holds that water. And maybe I've been using better brushes as time's gone on, but I don't know how that's happened except for practice, practice. But I remember that being like, oh, I need so much paint, it won't hold. And it's just that mixture and also holding the brush kind of on an angle this way. It's holding that, um, I can show with this guy. You know, some people paint down and so you're gonna have a lot more gravity and flow and I kind of paint up so my brush is like this and I, I'm able to maybe release more paint when I'm ready by turning it this way. And that's just come from years of, of figuring that out in a really subconscious way. But thanks for the question. Thanks, Leah. Uh, Cindy says, beautiful Leah, this has been very informative and inspiring. Thank you for this demo. Naomi says, Look, looks amazing. Thank you, Leah. And Thank then you guys. Naomi has a question. Uh, is there a way to fix it if you mess up outside the Raven outline and have a brush stroke on your beautiful blank linen canvas? Uh, quick answer, no. <laughs> what I do to circumvent that is typically I didn't do it today, but typically I have my wad of paper towel to dab off my brushes. But for a while I had a wet, clean and it's damp paper cloth. And I have dripped, I have flicked on that. And it's like, ah, no, no. And because this is primed, if it was not primed, of course it would just, you know, there's no getting away from it. But sometimes I've been able to kind of like wipe it really quickly. Um, and that's been a rare time. Um, I've managed to train myself so that I don't flick a lot, but it does happen, happen just the other day. And sometimes you work a feather into that bloop. Like <laughs> some of my ravens, if you see, have really big you know, throat feathers. There's a chance that there was a bloop there and thankfully it wasn't too far away. I was like, okay, we'll just make that into a feather. <laughs> and then these ones, these kind of painted canvases, of course, you know, they have the white, then you can, paint that out. I took my canvas to the paint store, had them copy match the exact color so I can touch up a little bit, but it's very tough. And so the answer, to be honest, is it's not super easily fixable. And it, painting on linen, especially, I go into it with a lot of holding my breath because um, it can be ruined just like that. And uh, especially my big linen canvases, I think that's why I hold so much tension in my whole body when I'm painting my back everything because I'm like okay I just can't go out of that and uh, I've been fairly successful but it happens and um, acting quickly to wipe it is good sometimes if you wipe too much it blurs it um, yeah so the answer is no you can't really easily clean it up thanks Leah um, Lorraine asks what you will do with this Raven beauty. And uh, I think you already kind of answered that, that it might be going down yeah. south. I'm not sure it might be going down south. So um, what I do is I do kind of three things as an artist. Um, I have have representation from this really awesome gallery in Gastown. They picked me up a few years ago, which is like a dream come true. I dreamt of that for like 20 years. Um, press my nose up against these gallery windows and being like, you know, how do I get into that? <laughs> and it finally happened. And that gallery, you know, requires, I commit to two collections a year that I send down to them. And that's anywhere from eight to 15 paintings per collection. And it's wonderful, but on the other hand, they're not paid outright. So you're doing all these like, what, 20 paintings over the course of months that are not generating money for you to help pay your bills and your home and and food and all your costs when you're strictly working as an artist it's your only income so you kind of take a chance and send those down and wait to see if they'll sell and to augment that i do bring on what i call custom commissions and um, people call me up and they want a specific size and they want a specific thing and i work really uh, in closely with those clients and make sure i get to do exactly what they want and they put a deposit down and so that helps me stay afloat while I'm doing these kind of paintings and so this one for example I think to myself well it could go down to the gallery sometimes I'll post a picture on it and maybe somebody 
will be like, I want to buy that. <laughs> and so I do kind of keep a few where, you know, if someone's interested, because I get questions once in a while that ask, you know, do you have any paintings for sale? And because I was doing one or the other custom commissions or the gallery, I didn't have extra room to be like, yeah, I, I do actually have one. So I might hold back on a painting or two. And, um, and if they don't sell, they just join me here in my house. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. Um, CC says, ravens are so pretty. I think we all agree. Um, and Naomi says, you made that look so easy. Um, Amy says, it is stunning. Thank you so much for sharing your process. Cece said, uh, this felt like 10 minutes, but it was two hours. Alexa says, I'm so proud of you, Leah. Jocelyn says, amazing. Thank you so much, Miigwech. Joan Bailey says, oh, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your process. Uh, Jocelyn has a question. What type of varnish finish do you use? Uh -huh. I don't use any varnish. Um, but I've been seeing other artists on Insta that I think they're working in oils and they use these amazing varnishes they put over the entire canvas and it just pops those colors and it looks like a lacquer. And I've been really envious of that and interested in that. I'm too shy and scared to put anything on here yet. So I need some time where I can experiment with some of that. Um, so varnishes and that I've, what I'm familiar with are really great with oils to help set those oils so they won't crack in time, I think. Um, and I've never used varnish on my acrylics. I kind of, these golden ones will dry with a slight sheen to them. Um, so they're not matte and I'm kind of happy with that. So, so no varnishes at this point. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dirk says, this was great, thank you. Lizette says, very generous of you to share. Diana Penner, uh, do you put a finish on the final product? I think you just mentioned that, or you just answered that question. Barbell says, you. gives yeah. me a whole new appreciation for that magnificent bird. Thank you for giving this gift to us. And Thanks, Barbell. Then Barbell has a question. Could you talk a bit about your choice of colors of the highlights? What makes you think of putting in yellow on a black bird? Ah, okay. Okay, so this is a cool little trick that I found. I kind of stumbled upon, I think, by accident. You know those happy accidents in art? <laughs> Where you're like, oh, that looks actually pretty cool. So I've found that when you just add white to your underlying colors, like I was doing on the palette, you end up getting what's called a monochromatic tone to your raven. And you're an artist as well, Barbell, so I know you know what I mean by that. And it can look flat to me. Um, it looks decorative, the feathers look good, but just by adding more and more white, the monochromatic look feels a little lifeless. So I've found that when I put that brown in there, it's a counter color to the blues and, and it almost supports them. Likewise, I've found that when I haven't used yellow in the highlights, the white, because I've been adding white, to these colors, it's, it just adds to the monochrome look. So just at the end, like I did with a little bit of yellow, a yellow underneath a white makes a white pop more. I don't know why, but some of my highlights are in fact not white, they're a yellowy white. And especially if you go into a brighter yellow, not the yellow ochre, but these really lighter, much more electrically charged yellows, just a little hint in there and then add the white. I think there's something with the color wheel, like there's the blues and teals are, and then the yellows as a primary as well. And so there's some kind of vibration that happens if you use primaries that are across from each other. So that's going back to art school stuff, but it's true. It's, it actually, you know, art school, if Cecilia, you're still on here, it's like you go to art school, they'll spend the first six months just mixing colors, mixing colors, and you do these little swatches, and then you spend six months just literally making marks with your brush. And it's when you're a student, you're like, this is so boring. <laughs> I wanna paint something, this is boring. It's called foundational studies. And when I was in school, all of us were like, this is so drab. And they had to add black and white and make it lighter to different tones of grays. And it was so boring. But now as a professional artist, all of that did support 
what I know and how I do things. So all of those foundational studies really count. I hate to say it. <laughs> Thanks, Leah, that's a great answer. Um, Nola says, thank you so much for the Raven demonstration, learned so much. Kathy awesome. said, loving it, learned a lot, thanks so much. Awesome, thank you. Lorraine says, merci, Hamia Megwich, for sharing your loving color and gesture, absolute gorgeous dance with your Raven in your home. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Lorraine is also someone that has helped me a lot with my art and, and does uh, painting with me and helps me with my paintings. Um, thank you for all of that. She's an amazing painter too. Laura says, this was great, thanks. Jennifer says, wonderful to watch your great techniques, very instructive and easy to follow. Holly says, love that you put the warm orange over the cold blues. Thank you so much for your main, amazing demonstration. You are very skilled. Oh, thank you, thanks guys. Naomi agreed, Polly, that warm burnt sienna was a surprise to me. Barbara says, thank you for arranging this wonderful, insightful presentation. Cynthia, thank you for sharing your amazing skill. I'm so glad I could change my plans today. Oh, See me too. Me. Well, I wanted to go to an art college because the middle school I'm going to doesn't have art. And then Colin, thank you very much for sharing your time with us. And that's it for the questions in the comment section. And uh, I don't know, Leah, if you want to open it up to some verbal questions now. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. I, I did want to say something about art school, if I may. Um, I really kind of struggled in art school and I went to a small community college after high school. I applied to one of the top art school, like a, a university, one of the top art schools. Um, I, some of you may know the story that I've talked to, but it's called the Ontario College of Art. And oh, that's the school I wanted to go into and I got rejected. <laughs> so anyways, I put all my eggs in one basket. I was 17, 16 or 17. And I was like, oh man, I'm gonna get in totally. Didn't get in. And I was, I got rejected on the basis that they said I was unteachable. And at 16, 17 years old, I didn't understand what that meant. And my portfolio to get in was, young Cecilia, if you're listening to this, um, my portfolio showed kind of the same style, just different subject matter, which was this high realism, you know, and the technique and the skills there, and it was there when I was 16, but they said I would always be that, that kind of style. And because the style is tight and rigid, they, they felt that I was unteachable, that I wouldn't be open to other styles, which years later now, I'm like, that's not fair. <laughs> that may or may not have been true, but here I am years later doing the same style. So anyways, I got rejected and I ended up going to a small community college and I was I kind of like a lot of young people kind of just didn't, I was not focused and not, you know, didn't take it seriously. I really wanted to do this high-end art school and kind of worked half measures and, um, and near the end, I started to pick up the slack and learn. But really what I'm trying to say is after I left art school, I started teaching myself. And it's great to be in an art environment. I love art schools, don't get me wrong. There's great ones and there's ones that aren't as great. And if you can find one that's really fosters a wonderful environment and they're out there, great. But if you don't, then you can possibly follow my path. And it's the discipline that people struggle with and I was just so obsessed and passionate about painting that I just and drawing I just did it all the time it's how I connect to the world I can't help myself and over time so maybe with an art school I could have learned this kind of could have reached my craft a lot faster um, but you can kind of explore by yourself that burnt sienna that brown that I put in there that was a happy accident you know by having that on the brush by accident and so it's just a different process of learning. 